Uh, I'm Rohit. I work at Google. I've been here at Google about four years now. Uh, presently, I work at Google as a solutions engineer. Uh, what does the solution engineer at Google do? Basically, I work with the Google Cloud team to help uh, various organizations, be it a startup or an existing organization or a very traditional 100, 140 years organization, to move to the cloud, design for the cloud, uh, or move from some other cloud to Google Cloud. Right? How many of you have heard about Google Cloud? Great, thank you. Uh, for others who haven't, what we are is what I'm going to just shamelessly plug in. So my whole talk today is going to be around Apache Beam. If you've heard about it, super cool. If you haven't, I'm going to make sure you go and search about it at least once. Uh, but this is my employer, uh, Google Cloud. So I need to plug in at least one slide uh, because they, they'll be paying the Uber built in here and back. Uh, so yeah, what we are, we are a cloud platform, just like any other cloud platform. So if you've heard about Amazon Web Services, uh, or Azure or some of the other ones that are coming up nowadays. This is it. We have all the table stakes. So if you want to just virtual machines to managed pass to containers to maybe big data pipelines, managed SQL databases, NoSQL databases. So all the mumbo jumbo that you can imagine. And then we add uh, some of the Google magic over it where we do a lot of machine learning, we do a lot of the managed solutions for you guys, and then we put in our great network, our great infrastructure to use here, right? So if you ever wanna check out what we do, uh, you can check it out at cloud.google.com uh, or just do a Google search for us, I think we should be number one there. But yeah, so we have been there in the market for quite a long time now, and if you've heard about some of the organizations, like have you heard about Spotify, right? Yes. Music streaming service? Yes. Completely running on Google Cloud, they recently, a year ago, decided that they want to move out of their own data centers to Google Cloud for many reasons. One majorly being our data platform, our big, how we handle data. Like, so I really want to apologize for the next statement, but I hate the term big data. Right? You may want to kill me and be like, what the hell? That is my job. That is what my passion is. But the that comes from because so when I joined Google and well and. Like, fortunately or unfortunately, Google has been my only employer. So when I joined Google, I was pretty much naive. I didn't know much about software engineering or what real world systems look like, especially when you talk about Google scale systems, right? Uh, and I was introduced to a lot of concepts in all of this when while I was learning. So the first three years of my life, I was working as a guy who did uh, web dev inside of Google, who did uh, data sciences at Google and then did machine learning at Google and today I'm doing this right so this is my fourth year at Google uh, they never told me something about big data like this this never came up in any discussion like I, I can sign on a paper on for you be it a legal tender I can sign on it we never talked about big data and then I came to this role where I started interacting super a lot with outside world with custom companies and what I realized was everybody's talking about big data and then I went back to someone who was who I consider still a guru at uh, data at Google, and I asked him, "What's the fundamental man? Like, why did you, you know, stab me in my back? Why wasn't I prepared for this?" And he's like, "The only problem is that what the whole world today is calling as big data, Google's always called it just data." He's like, "Go ask your so-called new friends that you made in the outside world, and ask them what is the biggest data pipeline that they run." Uh, and then he said, compare it to what is the biggest data pipeline you wrote at Google. So the biggest data pipeline that I wrote at Google was about 2.6 million events per second. Right? I don't know if that's big or not. How many of you have are running pipelines that are bigger than this? <laughs> I'm sorry, it is a fact because the team that I was working on was AdWords. And what I was looking for while working on AdWords is fraudulent behavior, abusive behavior. So we literally had to analyze each and every click view of AdWords that was happening. So I was like, yep, you're running pipelines that are 2 to 2.6 million events per second and they run 24, 7, 365. These aren't like short run pipelines that we run for probably 15 minutes and then we run them next month. So this was great. I had great exposure to this. But then I realized that there are different kind of problems outside in the world, right? So that is how this whole notion of big data doesn't set with me. And whenever I'll be referring to <coughs> anything data, it just assumes it's big data, right? So 
Do you guys know about this game called as Pokemon Go? Right. Where does that run? Google Cloud. Super. That runs on two of my favorite products, uh, Kubernetes, which is a container management system, and data storage. Which is, but that's where they run. But you have that whole mumbo jumbo, right? I need to analyze how many users are coming, how my how long my sessions are, where is the next stampede going to happen, right? When do which country do I need to launch next because they haven't launched India till now. Uh, so yeah, that's that's a big problem. And uh, so I'm going to take a similar example and see what they are trying to do and how Google has been helping them, right? Sounds good. So let's say I'm building a game where you have to capture animals. Uh, fictitious animals uh, and my goals are I need to write interesting data computations why because data is amazing I think we all agree right data has got great power if we can mash it up merge it up in the right ways we have great insights coming for us right uh, the second is I need to write both batch and streaming why because since I'm a global application I have users 24 7 365 uh, using my application I need to make decisions on the fly and then I need to do some batch computations that could be a weekly analysis, monthly analysis, or whatever, right? Uh, I need to use custom timestamps. And I'll tell you why. Because this is a mobile application, right? Uh, and India is not the only place where connections die and then restart, right? And then connections go bad, you go inside a tunnel, nothing's there, you come outside, data's back. Now, when the data gets back on, whatever happened while I was in the tunnel, still needs to be streamed and that is still data that me as a company wants to understand, right? So I want to use custom timestamps. All I'm saying is record the timestamp not when the data comes into my system, into my cloud, record the timestamp when the event happens on the device, right? Which is a whole shock of different problems. If you've ever tried doing this, just try. It's going to like, you know, complicate your troubles by 10x. How I know this is, I was writing uh, pipelines for, as I said, AdWords. And uh, three weeks into my this new role of writing pipelines at Google, uh, I wrote my first MapReduce pipeline. Pretty cool. I was very excited. Go show it to my boss. Uh, and my boss is like, it's useless. Now, that was heartbreaking. I went back to the bathroom, cried a bit, and then came back. And then I said, OK, how do I fix this? What's the trouble? Tell me. And he's like, everything seems fine. The logic that you've put in, the mathematics that you've put in kind of makes sense. But what you're looking at is the timestamp when this event, this click, came to our system. And he said, there are 10 systems before that that are getting this. So there are 10 systems before that when it even enters the Google system. And then outside the Google system, we're not even considering. When the click really happened on a person's mobile phone or laptop, is still a certain lag away. And for someone who's probably sitting inside our data center or just in a house next to our data center, that lag may be a few microseconds. But someone who's probably sitting thousands of kilometers away from our data center, that could be a few seconds. Now, again, since I am naive, naive I had, didn't have much experience, I used to think these are the same things, but then he showed some statistics to me and I agreed, hugely different things. Right? This could be the difference between something going viral and not going viral. Right? And something that I kind of touched upon, handling late, late data, right? very important. And why this became more important to me was that since these 10 systems that were there earlier, right? similarly, let's say my game, a few systems are there before me, the data team really gets to analyze it, gets my hands over it. Uh, those systems fail. Right? How many of you take data from systems that are dependent and have failed? Right? Have you been in a situation where we failed data? Right? Yeah. And how much irritating is that? Right. Yeah. And how many of you have run then separate backfill pipelines for that? How fun is that? No, really, like, not not a sarcastic comment, but running backfill pipelines was my favorite thing at Google. Why? Because now I was not at blame. I was the savior, right? Now, suddenly, there is this lag of data where we don't have anything, a window, black cloud window, 
uh, and then everyone's after me people are calling me people are pinging me they're like rohit please please run it yaar like we need this data how do we get it please run it and all that i'll be like yeah i got too much work to do you know i i can i think i have something at p not i can't have, agree this probably p2 no no we need to and then a uh, vp or a director would probably send me an email rohit we got to do this mm-hmm. and then i'd be like okay maybe i can put it on a p not But yeah, so coming on my learnings of data, right? So as I said, we didn't know what data was, and data can be big for our situation. Data is just big, right? I'm assuming uh, nearly a few million users who are doing at least a few thousand clicks in a day or a few thousand interactions with my game in a day. So data is by default big. It's really big that every day's data is getting bigger and bigger, right? And now. this is what i think you guys have been discussing since morning streaming data data is infinitely big it's unbounded right so i don't know where it is going to end and this is the lovely thing that i was talking about something let's say happened at 8 am and thankfully got registered at 8 am but then something got delayed and this is kind of marginal delay i can work with it right let's say i'm running an early pipeline this would still get registered what we need to nine so my pipeline is still green my data is still relevant but this is the notorious one that guy decided to come after 2 pm right like that doesn't work because my pipeline was running from 8 to 9 and once it's done 8 to 9 i can't accommodate that data now this this is out of my calculations right this is what micro batches right now you can make this window from an hour to 5 minutes to 1 minute but that's what micro batch is right and if you are writing streaming pipelines this is a big pain late events are the biggest pain to me okay so basically the problem here is that my internet is slow and this is running from google slides so sometimes the slides are taking a bit of time to load up yes So these are the three trade-offs that I learned of, and you could agree with me. If you disagree with me, please let me know, and I'd like to improve this. Right. So this is the data tra- processing trade-offs that I learned about. Uh, being one is completeness. Right. I, I, and the guys who need to take the decision on that data would love to have completeness, but completeness comes at a cost. The second is latency. how late are you fine with this data coming up in your results third is cost right if you want to increase the number one and number two this is going to go high right few examples <coughs> whenever airtel decides to give me back internet Oh yeah. Okay. So, let's say I'm running a billing pipeline, right? Now, the core importance here and the, if you see the left side of the graph is how important it is to hire the graph, the more important that is. Example, billing pipeline, right? Completeness is very important. I can't be like let's chunk off a few hundred dollars from the AdWords billing and Google will be fine, right? And if we do it per customer, no. So, billing pipelines most important. That is why I was not allowed to handle that. Right? uh low latency we kind of fine we can we can send a bill after an hour right it's not like we're charging them per second right they will probably just pay us once a month or once a week right <coughs> cost has to be moderate right because we don't want to run a pipeline that is as expensive as the bill so i can't run a pipeline that goes earning 10000 dollars 10001 dollars was my cost of running the pipeline not including my salary right uh so that's fine life cost estimates right so let's say this is google trying to analyze or pokemon go trying to analyze what is the cost of each event or each pokemon animal that i'm deploying in the world right what does that look like because this always has to be so the completeness is kind of fine right we are fine with an 80% or a 70% accuracy here latency is kind of the thing that we are beating right we need to make sure that latency is low here right because this is life processing this could be deciding whether i launch another pokemon in new york street or not this could be whether i just launch right now a pokemon here and ideally if you all were pokemon go players this would be a great place for me to launch it 
right? And latency is here is important because right now you're in this room, so launching a Pokemon out there, probably a rare one, would be the best thing to do, right? And if that this latency, let's say, pushes me off by a few minutes or hours, go on. You guys are gone now, right? Low cost. I can spend more money here because this probably defines engagement for me, right? This defines revenue for me. Abuse detection pipeline, something that I was supposed to do. So uh, you can see this is the lowest ever, right? Uh, so completeness is okay, but again, latency matters because we need to detect abuse happening when and where it is happening. So let's say uh, someone in Japan is starting to abuse my Pokemon Go game, right? And now this is going to be a very short time because he starts an abuse or he or she starts an abuse cycle. Right. And within 10 to 15 minutes, it's gone. And believe me, in AdWords, we had abuse segments which were alive for about just 5 seconds. So that is the window we had to identify them, stop them, catch them, uh, maybe punish them or, you know, do something bad with their accounts, uh, mark that, uh, label that and then go ahead. Right. So that is that is the windows we had to work with. Uh, yep. Abuse detection backfill pipelines, right? My favorite thing, the things that I was expert at. As you can see, low cost needs to be there, right? So get your most cheapest engineer that is Rohit to work on it. Uh, but other than that, completeness is kind of important here. We need to understand this is backfill, right? So we need to. But latency here doesn't matter, right? Like we've already had that trouble. It's a backfill operation. Another 15 minutes or 10 minutes is not going to make it. So these are like how we see uh, or how I believe we've categorized around the three different, uh, I, I call it like vectors of data, right? Now this is the most interesting thing. Uh, I wasn't part of Google throughout this, I was part of Google through 2012 through today. So I know some part of this, but I've heard this story from people who have been there since 2006, 2010, I've heard this many versions, right? But this is how Google evolves through data. So what Google started doing is, and if you remember what our core or our basic business was, is, uh, hey, sir, thank you for remembering that. Uh, we still do search, yes. Uh, so we started to search, and how we started with search was that we started scraping the whole web. That is not really the business where you want to cry about data, because all you're trying to do is create more and more data at a daily level, or probably an hourly level. So our biggest problem to start with was how do you store this enormous amount of data, right? Uh, how many of you here use Hadoop or the Hadoop ecosystem? I know, pretty much everyone. Uh, what file storage system do you use? Right. Uh, have you read the HDFS paper? Right. So that's the first thing there. GFS 2002, uh, written by one of, uh, two of my favorite engineers, uh, and you can read that paper, it is so beautiful. Then you read HDFS code, superly disappointed. <coughs> but it works, it works, right? So, no, not, not taking shots at anything. But then, 2004 was when uh, we created this awesome thing called as MapReduce. The basic problem was, like being very frank, it wasn't that awesome. Like, the basic problem was, we couldn't compute whatever we were doing in one single computer. Even buying the biggest computers that were available at that point of time to us, uh, we couldn't do everything. So what we said is, divide and rule, right? So we kind of, I think they haven't given, a, but we should appreciate the British divide and rule policy for this, for this paper being alive. Uh, so that was there. And then we created doing something, but during this time, like 2004, 2010, uh, we had a big problem. We created MapReduce, and MapReduce was amazing. Our engineers really loved it, uh, but <coughs> everybody was writing MapReduces. People who should not be writing were also writing MapReduce. Uh, the biggest problem with that is misuse, right? Not misuse that they were uh, doing wrong processes, but the misuse was that they were running these processes, and if you've run any basic Hadoop jobs, right, and you can see, if you've seen the timeline for your jobs, there is that one notorious job that does just disagrees to shut down. Right? It will never get complete. Right? Like you can start a job today, come back tomorrow, that, that stupid job is still running. That one single, everyone's done their job. Everyone's done, like I'm done, uh, chill, sara kaam ho gaya, that job. 
that one single one is abhi nahi hum jo abhi bhi kaam kar rahe right and that now imagine that running on tens and thousands of data pipelines across google at a daily level so you have these notorious jobs who are blocking clusters all across and you are like we need to solve this so they did some libraries over the time to solve it but then in 2008 they took a decision we need to shut everything down like not shut everything down and stop using my produce but shut everything down of doing this small libraries to improve stuff and start something doing something like right and this was a, a quote that i had recently read but i think it is pretty old it says that to really innovate you need to stop worrying about what you are doing today shut down everything and start thinking about what you really want to achieve right so that is how innovation happens and thus came flume java now flume java is saying write a system right that can run massively parallel uh, map reducers for you can optimize them and can manage contain or manage the clusters for you right so what after flume java happened was uh, we now have a service at google called as flume right you can use java c++ some other but basically java is the core with, with, in which it is written at and you can submit this code which is going to do map reducers but i or you don't create those clusters number one super cool i don't need to worry about clusters so there's a super huge pool of uh, compute resources ram resources storage resources available which is going to run this pipeline for me then it will read the pipeline code created into a dag right uh, direct acyclic graph and now look where can we optimize things right how can we avoid those stupid nasty jobs to running forever right and then one another thing that it did which mostly changed all of this was it added fluidity to jobs right so map reduces about saying i want to do massively parallel jobs across commodity hardware right great now if i'm really doing jobs across commodity hardware i'm distributing them they are pretty much same in the nature why can't i break a job that is taking too much time and divide it among maybe two n resources right i should be able to do that right so that is what is able to do it does a lot of other things but these are the two major things that it was able to do that has changed a lot of google since then right and then it was great flume java great for batch great for mini batch we made we kind of used it for mini batch but then we realized in 2012 now everybody is giving us this huge amount of data right and we want to do stream processing we have basically reached our mini batch to 1 minute level and we realized no click like, 1 minutes of so many mini batches means we want to do stream so we did more research we introduced mini wheel which is there now these three major technologies gave birth to data flow right so coming to map reducer amazing stuff you prepare your data shuffle it across multiple workers reduce it and then your data or your end result is ready right pretty much the concept we all are aware about this <coughs> then flume java came which said let's add a high level api right which makes data processing simple for you can abstract some of the common jobs that you need to do so you can focus or engineers can focus on writing or achieving the capability so if i need to do a plus b i can concentrate on how a plus b needs to be done rather than worrying that hey how many nodes are going to do a how many nodes are going to do b and how do we finally do a plus b right and then basically create graphs right those are acyclic graphs that we start create creating uh, which can start doing some optimization of them. yep so coming to how we came to batch batch became like super batch it started becoming micro batches at some point of time and we said what we need to do is sessions right we need to do streaming so streaming was just another way of saying you need to build a process a framework that can run through low latency data processing applications right that was all basically tag along so much of processing so that it becomes low latency yeah so how we do this and uh, like how these are some of the again, major patterns that we have seen in streaming one of them is filtering right there are 
multiple events coming, right? So let's say there are multiple events that or interactions that my gamers are doing with the application, but I only care about when they capture a Pokemon, right? That is only what I care about. So what I need to do here is I need to do filtering and then only this is the data that I really care about, right? So that is one of the most common use cases that we have. Second is doing aggregation on time-based windows, right? So let the data come in stream, but I want to understand how many Pokemons were captured every hour, right? Probably a graph like that. And then what I also want to do is I want to create event-based windows. Now, how is this difficult or different than your regular windows? Is that in the regular windows, I don't care about anything, right? I don't care what event happened when, I don't care about it. Here, I want to aggregate them by events also, right? So, I'm doing two tasks in one single transformation that I'm trying to look after. And then, I want to create sessions. I want to understand, once a guy comes online my game, how long is that guy trying to play my game continuously, right? So, this guy probably played from there to there, there to there, and this then stopped over, right? So, this is the common problem then that finally comes out, right? You've got your processing time, and then you've got your event time, right? Now, my processing will take some time depending on the number of events that there are, the complexity that the pipeline is trying to create, right? Which will not be constant, right? I wish it was constant. That dotted line that you see is if it could be a straight constant and O1 that I could define, right? Unfortunately, it is not. So there is this queue that keeps coming up. And what you have as the red line, right, is a watermark. Right? Have you guys heard about this concept of watermark in data processing? Okay, great. I have also hadn't heard it till recently. I heard about it. I couldn't understand it the first time. Probably I'm dumb. Uh, I, but the basic idea is once you learn about it, once you get it, it's such a cool concept, right? What it is say is that I will set a low watermark on the data processing that I'm trying to do. What does that mean? Is that given at some time t where the watermark is being set, right? At that point of time, I am saying or I'm assuming all events for that computation before that. So it could be windowed com computation, it could be se session based computation are already there for me to run the pipeline, right? And have been processed, two things, right? All events are there, no event is missing. Second, processing is completed. So that is what the red line here means. There are events coming in sometime. So basically consider the amount of time, let's say these are all nicely behaving events for now, right? Nothing is coming late. Everything is coming when it is supposed to. Something that happened at 8 is coming at 8, right? Then there is this skew of processing that, that comes in, and that will become my watermark, right? So event processing time is there my watermark. But then you just add the delay that I'm considering here for me to cover up on events that were left over, and that is how it runs, right? So what we are just saying is create a watermark, which is a heuristic-based concept of saying my all events have come in and have been processed. So I'm confident enough to say my data is correct. Now, coming to the beam model, right? So, given that we were facing all these troubles, we had this and so we wanted to solve this and now we just didn't want to solve it for ourselves. We wanted to solve it for everyone because we knew everybody was doing big data. We knew how popular Spark was at that point of time uh, and Hadoop was and all other systems were. And we said, let's build a model, right? Let's bring a new model that we have learned from our experience of data processing and we asked four basic questions, right? What are you computing? Which defines what kind of a job I'm trying to run, right? Where is the event time? When is the processing time, right? So this basically attributing toward the watermark concept and how do refinements relate, right? Now what we're trying to say with how do refinements retain, uh, relate is when you're doing this various transformations on your data, be it filtering, be it aggregation, be it enrichment, right? They usually have some relations. And if we can understand those relations, we can optimize your pipelines, right? You can write simplistic code, which can further be optimized so that processing times are much faster. That is what we're trying to do with this. So we're saying you create a pipeline, right? And then 
if you have done coding in Java or C hash, right, you know this concept called as collections, collections framework, right? Uh, if you are someone who's done Python or Ruby, it's basically what your regular stacks of data or data structures are, right? So what we're saying is we extend that concept since Sloop Java was written there, so we basically took Java's collection framework and said, what if this could be a massively parallel collection framework? Like collections today, when you create a normal collection in uh, Java or in C hash, what you're doing is you're creating that and that basically lives in the RAM, right? One system's memory, it can live there. As soon as it gets bigger, you can't create a collection, right? Have you tried creating a collection that is bigger than your RAM size? Go try to do that, most probably your Java program is going to crash, right? Uh, now, what we did, we said that build a P collection, which is parallel collection, right? Which can basically live all over in multiple systems and still talk to each other, right? We built that. <coughs> so, what you create is you create a P collection T, right? So, T is, this is basically format saying T could be anything. T could be a string, an integer, a variable, whatever kind of variable you want to define right, a data type, and this can be bounded or unbounded. So if you want to do batch processing, this is going to be bounded. If you want to do stream processing, this is going to be unbounded, right? So a single P collection, same collection of data can now be utilized in both <coughs> sources, right? And each element will have at least one thing with it, a timestamp, right? So timestamp has become the first class citizen when you're working with P, right? Then what I do is once I have these P collections, so I have data which needs data A, data B, I need to do A plus B and give me C, right? So the plus that I'm doing, the uh, addition that I'm doing is a transformation, right? Now you could classify this basically end of the day what I feel is that anything that we're writing in these pipelines is just mathematical code, right? Doing something over aggregation, some kind of uh, filtering, all this is just mathematics, right? So all we're doing is though that mathematical function is basically a transformation that we're trying to do here. Now you can complex that formula as much as you want, but that is ideally one transformation that you're doing. Something that can be done parallelly across multiple PCs, multiple computers, right? And then that can come as input from various P collections and can output a P collection, right? Simple. Right. Now let's see some basic code. I've got p collection string raw, which is basically lines of code, logs, right? Uh, I can load it up from anywhere. Then I can create a key value pair, which is basically my map. I'm trying to create a simple map and apply a transformation on it, right? What you'll see here is par do. Par do is parallelly do this, right? <coughs> parallelly do this basically take this function that I'm giving you, which here is parse fn, right, a custom function that I may have wrote somewhere, and parallelly do this. Now, parallelly do this does amazing thing where Beam as the framework will automatically take what you wanted to do, right, spread it across n number of uh, computers that it is required to achieve that functionality, right, uh, take your code, distribute it, do the whole map, basically coming back to the map reduce, right, map it, shuffle it, uh, transform or process the data, reduce it down to results, give it the output. Right. That's all we're trying to do here, but with better semantics, better coding semantics that you can give to some other coder and he can or he, she can read it. Right. My biggest problem with some of, some of the Hadoop code and the Spark code that we write, and especially Scala, is nobody else can read it. Right. Uh, any of you face troubles reading Scala code written by other engineers? Right. Biggest pain. Right. Like I would literally scrap that and start something else. Right. Uh, so, yeah, now this is a cool animation if it works. What I'm saying is, I have multiple events that have come through, right? And now I need to draw a watermark, right? Remember the definition of watermark, right? So, definition of watermark says when I'm sure that data has come in and now processing can start. And so, I draw a watermark saying, uh, a lot of events have come in and then I'm assuming that since these will take that amount of time under the triangle, right, for processing, so I'm just taking that as a lag and I'm assuming rest will come through by the time it comes, right. So this is a great data set, this is a data set that is complying with my watermark at this point of time, right. But how many of you agree that this is a real life data set? No. 
Why? Because mostly, uh, at least I will start my watermark at 12.02. As soon as the first event comes, let's start that watermark. Let's start processing. Right? Super, we started processing. But then, these nasty late events will start showing up. But, for this certain example, I'm saying, okay, no worries. Let them just go through since this is a normal pipeline. Yep. All I'm saying is basically just keep summing them up as you see the events, right? A normal batch job, nothing difficult here. Right. Now we're introducing the concept of event time, right? Remember, every P collection that you're creating, every element there is going to have a event time attached to it, right? And now I will have to create an awesome concept. I don't know who invented this, but I really hate that person, windowing. Right. Let's window the events. And then somebody came up with sliding windows. Right. And then somebody came up with sessions. And uh, that's why I hate Google Analytics. Uh, but yeah. So all I'm saying is I can have fixed windows. I'm kind of fine with that. I can write fixed windows. Sliding windows is where I have the real trouble. When does a window start? When does a window end? Right. Uh, I need to write so much extra code to just realize when an event came in and then trigger a event so that the sliding window can start. Real pain. Right. <coughs> but thankfully, Beam makes it pretty easy. Beam said, a trouble for everyone. Uh, Google realized uh, that it's a trouble for everyone. Let's just automate that concept and make it a simple code semantic that you can write and just works. So we say, coming back to the same P collection, I create a map. Uh, it's going to be the output, input. Now apply the dot apply, is like apply this transformation and window into fixed windows of two minutes. Can you believe it? Code that I can read, written by a data engineer. The last two minutes. So this is fixed windows of two minutes, right? So, so, so at 12 the data will be from 1 to 12 Yes. So the first side, if you see, it says key 1 to 3, and those are the fixed windows. That is the uh, time 1 to time 2, time 2 to time 3, time 3 to time 4. Right now we are talking about fixed windows of two minutes each, right? What's the smallest window that you can have? Anything, I think you can go down to nanoseconds. Anything that your computer can recognize. Right. Uh, I think Java right now works with what epochs, which is uh, thousandth of a second. So yeah, now you can see I'm automatically creating windows here. Right. Kind of works. Uh, yep. So <clears throat> now coming back to the concept of processing time and watermark, if you remember that, what if we want to do sliding windows and sessions, we have to introduce this concept of triggers. When an event of that sort comes, right, which is probably the start or the end of my sliding window or my session, right, that is a trigger that will happen, right. Now, you may be writing tr triggers in various sorts uh, using various libraries or moving to something like Flink or Apex to basically have additional capabilities. Uh, Beam also realized this and Beam said, let's just automate this, make it an easy library so that everybody can use it. So what we're saying again, coming back to is fixed windows dot same thing, two minutes windows, but now you are doing sliding windows and you're saying trigger it at the watermark. Right? And now Beam is going to calculate that watermark for you. Beam is going to look out for that windows to kind of complete or that certain condition to agree so that it can start a sliding window for you, right? Uh, the way watermark concept is not clear. I agree. Uh, <laughs> one of the worst concepts ever, right? Basic thing saying is that uh, this slide, as you see, these are various events that are coming in, yeah. right? And at some point of time, I need to start my uh, processing, right? Now, you as an engineer who understands the system, will say, okay, I'm assuming everything that starts at 12 would probably have come in by 12, 5, right? That is when I can start my data processing, right? And I am now pretty much sure that everything that happened between 12 to 12, 1, let's say, I'm working for one minute window here, right, is in by 12, 5. So 12, 5 is my watermark for the, right? now I will continue increasing this for each minute and that will become my watermark graph, right? So after 12, 5, we'll ignore the event in regular cases, yes, we do that, right? As I said, if you remember that 8 wala slide, 
I was saying something came at 8 and something came at 8.30. I'm fine if I'm processing till 8 to 9. But then something came at 4 o'clock. That became a trouble for me. And in regular case scenarios, uh, we do ignore it. Right? How many of us write pipelines that look for late events? Right? What we do this for this is we build backfill pipelines. Right? We fill reconsolidation pipelines. We will compute the result from 12 to 12, 1. Uh, sorry, 12 to 1, let's say. Uh, at and we'll push out the result by let's say 12 30 30 minutes my processing time right and then end of the day we'll again run a pipeline to double check whether the results were there or not right agree that is how we most probably do it anybody does it in a different way right so i need to somewhere define my watermark somewhere my pipeline needs to start so at a watermark me as an engineer is kind of confident that all events between this time window that i need to calculate are there already right and then watermark will basically become the time plus the time that it takes to process it. Uh, Google Beam uh, can be integrated in Hadoop uh, ecosystem or can it be an alternative for Spark Stream? Uh, it can be integrated and I think we'll come to that in a bit of detail. I want to con con cover some of the concepts that we offer and then we can talk about runners and uh, specific code level things. Sure? Sounds good? Right. If I don't cover it, just remind me at the end. Uh, but yeah, so coming to sliding windows, what we are saying is that, and this has an example of late event, right, if you'll understand. So what I'm saying is I'm confident, I start the processing, it takes some time, it's only one event, less time taken to process, right, kind of, and here, more events, more time taken to process, but this is basically the pink line that you see, which is rising up with there, creating the this, is my watermark. Right. And so, I, so you're calculating watermark? Based on the events that are coming. Yes, yes. Right. Uh, to get greater understanding of watermark, I would recommend you check out this YouTube talk by one of the Google engineers who wrote the whole concept of watermark. Uh, I'll probably share the... So there are four or five uh, things that I would recommend you guys read or watch. One, two of them are these O'Reilly white papers called a Streaming 101 and 102. Uh, I'll share the links, read those, amazingly great, talk about how batch to stream has happened and it just talks about in a general world, right, and talks about some of the concepts we are solving. It doesn't talk about why you should use Beam or anything, it's not advertising. Then we have some of the Beam engineers given talks at O'Reilly conferences or Strata conferences and I'll share those links also. One of them talks uh, for about one hour and 30 minutes only about water. So I have watched that video four times to get hold of that concept. Right. So don't be ashamed if you have to watch that video. Right. So, but the basic concept is that now with this simple piece of code, I can get Beam to automatically run sliding windows for me. Right. We are, we are missing nine, right? Yep. We'll come to that. Right. So that is late event. That is the anomaly here. And thank you for pointing that out. Right. We have an event that bloody came late. Then it should be coming. Right. And as Indian schools, you are not allowed to enter. Right. <laughs> Paper starts at 12, max 12.5, uske baad nahi. We won't allow you to enter. So, Mr. Nine, you are not appearing for the exam. Right. I wish I could say that to my manager and my manager would be happy. Right. But business doesn't agree with it. Business still wants that nine there. Right. Now, this is the cool concept of triggers getting extended into late and early firings. Right. What I am saying is, if the data is complete before the my expected watermark start processing it right so if this five has been a good kid and came to school on time let's give him the exam and start let him allow to write right why should he wait till 12 5 to start the exam right and then since we are a democracy and we need to respect everyone Mr. Nine, who decided to come late, still should be allowed to give an exam. Right. So what we're saying is, now, just by writing simple code, without you having to define a whole library, think about all of the edge cases, right, you can start doing early firings and late firings, right. So early firing, you're saying that at period minute one, basically every one minute, keep checking. If the pipeline, who, if the data is already in, start processing it, right? Because we have the cluster, it's ready, start firing. And uh, at late firing, we are saying, uh, at count here one means basically any one event. So 
what we are trying to say here is do calculate the late events but let's say you are saying since you are late I'm not going to just do it for you but probably when five of you are late I want to consider you guys right so it's basically saying ki aapke akele ghar aap late hue to aapki galti hai like agar lekin aapke puri road pe jam tha hum sabko naya paper denge right so So, right, so that is what we are saying is that Beam cannot be always sure. What we are just trying to say is since the event timestamp is coming with us, like at some point of time we will start gaining some confidence, right? So I am saying, uh, let's say I was seeing, now come back to this. So you are saying that it's just a manual thing, you just figure out and then configure it? No, so this is an automated thing that is happening for you at the back end. You don't need to manually configure it. All we are saying here is that my data 5 came at 12 earlier than 1201 right so it came with probably a time stamp of 12 right 1200 is what the time stamp it came it with and then the second data set came in at 7 right sorry the 7 came in at probably 122 right after that 8 3 4 all those are coming at 123 124 12, so now i'm slightly confident that all the events that are coming are much after the current window size so they must be from the next window and most probably it's fine but if you see it's not like google data flow or beam said i'm not going to process it says yep i'm going to run a process but then when it realized 9 came with a time stamp which was much older right it was still able to process it because it had late firing on it right so we are not saying we are 100% confident or we understand your data set or your stream but all we are saying is now you can do early and late firing right why not process and make that data available why wait for a 200 minute window right does that answer your question i again don't know yeah does that answer your question somewhat yeah. right basically what we are trying to say is that if an event is there let's process it and if you are pretty much confident all the events that are coming are there but then there will be those use cases edge use cases where that event is coming super late right maybe a system was shut down it took them 3 hours to recover it but then since late firing is there the data processing pipeline can still read that and give you the exact data so you won't need to have run a reconciliation or backfill pipeline after 8 hours or end of every day right your streaming pipeline is able to do that right indeed uh, uh, yeah if you are using or specifying the thresholds to uh, early and late firing yes why is water not watermark is as you say watermark is a concept of triggering saying that i want to do all of this right i could say my pipeline is a batch pipeline and i don't want to do all of this now beam can be much faster in that scenario not look for all of this not do all that extra processing <coughs> right or i can introduce the concept of watermark and say let's do all of this extra stuff because maybe my pipeline is a streaming pipeline maybe your pipeline is an internal pipeline that you're 100% confident about you don't need watermarks there Right. Then your watermark is pretty much a simple thing. So first of all, watermark is a concept. It's a mental concept, logical concept, right? Now there, your watermark will pretty much be along the lines of the stream processing, right? Like, uh, the uh, like uh, X one, right? The X X Y one graph, right? But if your pipeline is a streaming pipeline and you are not confident about, and you know that there are these, this is how your data or your pipeline behaves, then you can start implementing these concepts, right? And watermark is a logical concept. will allow you to build all of this in your pipeline right otherwise you will say rohit how do i know when do i write this or not right and watermark is that concept that allows you to understand when i write it right and how i write it Sure, but I just got the work from organizers that we're going to take some of these complex questions at the end. So I'm going to be here, and I can be here till nine in the evening or night uh, to answer questions and get into whiteboarding sessions also if needed. Uh, so let's take this offline if you're fine, right? <coughs> Yeah.
Yeah, so this basically talks about how our firing worked and how with adding the watermarks, the speculative firing, the late firings, we were able to get better results out of our uh, this thing. Right. Yep. So the idea is that Beam has thought about a lot of these thanks to the experience that we've had at Google. And now since Beam is an open source project, uh, we are getting these experiences from not just us, but a lot of these contributors. And actually, there are more than 1,000 contributors in GitHub at this point of time who have contributed. And this is literally one of the most popular, well, not, uh, this is the second most popular library that Google has launched on GitHub, number one being TensorFlow. Uh, but yeah, you can achieve a classic batch scenario, a batch with fixed windows, streaming, streaming with late and speculative data, stream with reaction data, right? All different kind of semantics you can include in it right with just one single framework so now if you'd ask me the question Rohit I can do batch with spark right or I can do batch with regular Hadoop or Hive right why the hell do I need beam because I'm gonna reply back to you saying your requirements are not gonna stay constant <coughs> something that I learned as soon as you build one pipeline achieve that right 10 different requests are gonna come when you achieve those 10 different requests no different requests are gonna come Right, and those requests will continue to elevate, which will keep adding these various conditions onto you. So you may want to start and invest with a framework that gives you this out, all out of the box, allowing you to use it when you require, right? Now, I'm going to quickly finish this off. Uh, what is data flow and what is Beam? Uh, I've been talking about it uh, and uh, like, thankfully, Beam is a name that comes from something. B for beam and stands for batch and EAM stands for end of stream. A framework that can do batch plus stream together. You don't need to think about two different frameworks, right? Data flow is what we launched or what we wrote as a white paper and cloud data flow is where we allow you to run your beam pipelines as a service, right? Pretty complex right now. Let's make it easy. Beam is unified model for running multiple routines Data flow, a great, great place in the cloud for you to run that. Right. But you're saying Beam is an open source framework. Beam is Apache. It's right now incubating in Apache. We are working for the 1.0 release very soon. Uh, what we're saying is one model, one framework, one methodology to write batch as well as streaming. Multiple SDKs today, you can write it, it with Java and Python. Uh, and uh, as I was saying, Spotify, who's a pretty big user and the great thing is they also have a great engineering team. They've written a Scala uh, uh, SDK for this also, right? Uh, what it does is it is basically a layer above the Java SDK. It takes your Scala, converts it into Java code for Beam to run it, right? And where do you run it, right? So you want to run it on your local machines. You can use our local uh, uh, direct uh, runner for testing. We've got Apex, uh, Flink and Spark runners also. So if you have a Spark cluster, if you have a Flink cluster, if you have an Apex cluster, you can run it. And you can run it with all features, right? Google and the Apache community are committed to making sure that everything that is available in Beam and Dataflow is available on every runner, right? We are not 1.0 today, so there may be a few features missing. But as soon as we hit 1.0, we assure you that every feature is going to be available on every runner, right? And actually... Google did not write the Apex runner, Google did not write the Flink runner and the Spark runner, right? Uh, Apex run was run, uh, written by the Apex team itself, Flink was run, written by data artisans, and Spark was written by Cloudera, right? So we've got a healthy community that is building up, everybody is doing great stuff. And then, if you're happy, if you have these superb running clusters, please do run them wherever you would like to. Uh, but if you're irritated with running your clusters, right? And uh, I've run some of these for very minimal use cases. I don't run super big pipelines on Hadoop or anything. And I am super irritated with them. I don't like my clusters at all. Thankfully, Dataflow is there where you can just write the code in same beam, right? No code changes. Everything remains the same. And you say, run this on Dataflow. Google, who has super amount of data centers, has a service which, as I said, always running service, huge pool. We will give you workers, we will give you everything automatically, give you monitoring and other things over and above it. Right, super. Uh, yep, as I said, this is what we plan to do. 
Beam is there, Python is there, we are adding, we are trying to build more languages where you can define and write your pipeline, use, right, define all of these concepts, right? And then choose one of the runners who use Flink, Spark, anything, or Dataflow and run it, right? End of the day, super cool execution for your pipelines. So is Beam a library or a framework? It is an SDK which encapsulates, uh, I would say it's a framework, it's less of a library because you can't import that library. Like You do import that library, it works as a library in a coding semantic, uh, but actually it talks about a methodology, to, so it's more of a framework. So how do we run it on Spark? Like we have to write a Spark program where we have to import this and... Uh, no, so you write a program in Java or Scala or Python, right? Uh, install the Beam runner on your Spark cluster. And say so run this. Run yeah, it has its own runtime. Right. So this is the roadmap that has been, and uh, I'm sorry, this is not really a great roadmap which talks about future. But basically, early 2016 is when we open sourced and started working on it. Uh, mid of uh, 2016, we've spent a lot in uh, stabilizing this. Uh, six late, which is the current time, we spent a lot in popularizing this and uh, integrating with a lot of other runners and. Uh, 2017, the plan is to add much more capability to this. But, but Spark doesn't have these uh, window concepts. By default, Spark doesn't have it. You widely write something or include libraries. I'm not sure what the latest libraries are that, to do that. I'm, but Flink has this by default. Yeah, so just to talk about one small thing that why it makes sense is to work with Beam is that a lot of the concepts that have been there in the Apache world, which we hugely respect and love, right, are a lot taken from these white papers that were written. And Beam or Dataflow is nothing but an amalgamation of all that same knowledge, right, by the people who had written it. So it's something that you could invest in, right. And one great customer of Beam and Dataflow is Google. right. So till we are not screwing up your search results, we're kind of doing a decent job, right. Uh, some of the extra things that you get is we do graph optimizations, we do smart worker, we do lifecycle management, everything, as well as your cluster management on data flow. So you actually never see a cluster. You just say, this is my job, this is the amount of money I'm ready to pay for it, right? And it will execute it as fast as it can, right? It will give you monitoring over it, it will give you APIs to work with it, command links to call it, it will give you logging functionalities, but the basic idea is you write the code and give it to us to run. Uh, I wanted to go over this example, but I think we are running out of time, so I'll just end it with one last thing once this kind of floats up. Yeah. So if you can see this slide, uh, this is what we think the regular lifetime of a, uh, a data engineer looks like. So you write the Spark code or the Hadoop code or whatever you're trying to write, right? And then you do resource provisioning, create a cluster, worry about whether you have space on the cluster. You handle growing resources. You take care of reliability, right? All nodes need to live. Uh, deployment, performance tuning, and this and this. At Google, we strongly believe that this doesn't work because internally how we do it is, as I said, it's a pool of resources available. You just call, you just push the job. There are some people who are supposed to look after it and let them look after it. In your scenario, it will be the Google Cloud people who will be looking after your jobs and making sure they run and they deliver what you want to do. And what you get to spend time on is data creativity. Create fun with data, right? Uh, if you want to try it out, <coughs> Beam is available on GitHub. Just download it, clone it, uh, work with it, uh, enjoy it. If you want to try Google Cloud out, we have $300 of free credit available. Just go to Google Cloud and it'll show a button there and again, a plugin for my employer. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, we've had great customers who have come over, really enjoyed it. Uh, not just the data plot from everything else. And I strongly believe in it. That's why I joined this team. I continue to come here uh, or go anywhere where I need to be to help make sure that this is a success. And finally, Yep, Spark, Flink. So, in the reverse 
Yeah, so if you want to run your Spark uh, Hadoop or like the Hadoop ecosystem, we you can use our VMs to run it uh, by yourself or we have something called as data proc, which is basically a managed uh, Hadoop service <laughs> where you click, you get an end node cluster that you define the number in, you get an end node cluster within 90 seconds uh, and you work with it, we take care of the yarn, the masters, uh, making sure the nodes are always available uh, and uh, yeah, uh, one thing which I think is pretty cool that we offer in Dataproc is that, oh, sorry, two things. One, it is plain vanilla Hadoop Spark and the whole ecosystem, right? Second, uh, you can dynamically scale up or scale down your cluster within 90 seconds and without having to pause or shut down your cluster, right? So these are the two amazing things that we offer there. So it's automatically handled based on the load or? Uh, no, we don't automatically handle it today. We are working on something to handle it automatically, but you can write scripts. So since we allow an API to talk to the YAN controller, you could look at <coughs> gross load or wait times and accordingly scale up or scale down. Right. collections are analogous to our data in To some extent. Uh, but we feel that they are much more performant and the way they have been written is much cleaner, which allows it to even scale up to, so like my pipeline that I was telling you, which does, it goes over nearly 8,000 uh, different nodes of computers and it doesn't break. Is it beautiful? Pardon? No, just like collections, it is non-mutable. Right. Uh, and something that is working across a number of nodes, consider like uh, at the same point of time, you don't really want to mutate it. Because for this uh, event enrichment and decoration, this is always a requirement that it may have a smaller data set. For so we take care of mutations in a better way where you, when you do transformations, you, you don't really need to worry about mutations, right? Because the transformation will take care of pushing it into a new peak collection and the beam model will take care of making sure that data and memory are taken care of. So you don't really run into the the, the famous Java IO memory error. Right. Yeah, yeah, there's one IO also, right. So super cool, these are my contact details if you need to reach out to me. Uh, I'm on Twitter, I am there on my email address also. Uh, I'm gonna be around here for another few hours till you guys wanna ask questions. Uh, have a great lunch and thank you for being so patient with me.